Christ. Also, uh, before you panic, I've already had a, a couple people, at least one, panic this morning over the chapters two and three of Re- <laughs> my goodness, we'll never get home. I said, well, we're going third world countries where they meet for two or three hours here this morning. No, we're just introducing this morning these messages. Uh, there's things as we approach these that I wanted to bring to bear before we dive in to the messages proper. And I know you're like, well, we already had two weeks, three weeks of introductory. Man, that was for the book. Now we're looking at this next part in the outline, the divine outline, which are the things which are. And it's chapters two and three. We're looking at the seven messages to the seven churches. We're getting ready to head into this portion of Scripture. And the prior Wednesday night, the last Wednesday night I was here before we went uh, out west, uh, I asked the, the folks to consider this coming into these messages. And the question I asked is, of what importance are these messages to the seven churches? And, and the, what I mean by that is of what import ought they to have to you and I, to us, when we look at these seven messages? And, I, and I, I, I throw these questions out to help us understand how important they are. We might ask, what kind of church ought we to be? What kind of church should Prairie Bible be? We could ask the question, what kind of church do we need? What kind of church do we need to have in our life? What kind of church does the world need? And then third question you might ask in in trying to get us thinking this way is what kind of church is pleasing to our Lord? What kind of church pleases our Lord. Now the answer as to of what importance ought we give to these messages, I would say this, they are critically important. They are vitally important for us as the church. Why are they so? Well, the, the, those last three questions all serve to answer because the content of these seven messages to these seven churches establishes that very thing. It answers those questions. What kind of church ought we to be? What kind of church do we need? Does the world need? And what kind of church pleases our Lord is answered in these seven messages. But what we're going to do this morning uh, as we go get ready to dive in here to these seven messages, is I want to hit on five introductory matters, five different points that, that I, I want us to consider in establishing why it is you should and we should as a church, but you as individual church members, we ought to prioritize what's in these messages. Why, why it should be something we want to understand fully. The first point I want to hit on on these introductory matters is the headship of Christ. The headship of Christ. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, the Lord said this. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail Against it. In Ephesians 5 and verse 23, the Lord said this Christ also is the head, Paul wrote this of Christ, Christ also is the head of the church. He's the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. Then in the same chapter, verse 25b through 27, he said, Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself a church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy 
and blameless. We're starting to see why it's important, these messages, as we look at who's the head of the church. Who is the head? It's Jesus Christ. And what we learn in the vision of Christ, go over to Revelation, you're already there, but look at these verses again. I'm going to read them quickly, but verses 9 through 20. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Potmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. To Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe reaching to the feet and girded across his chest. With a golden sash. His head and his hair were white. Like white wool. Like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze. And it has, when it has been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was shining like the sun in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Therefore, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Our risen, glorified Lord Jesus is the head of His church. This is not your church. It's our church only because it's His church. And we follow Him. We love Him. He's our Savior. It's His church. I will build my church. And He, this glorified one, moves in the midst of the churches. He sees everything in His church. He knows exactly what He wants to see in His church. There are things that please the Lord and there are other things that displease our Lord. And it is incumbent upon us as his church to care about that. He's the head. He's the one who has the authority over us. We do not make the church unto our own image or our own likeness or our own vein. We should seek to make the church exactly what pleases Him. And that's why these messages are so important. How do we cleanse? How do we do this? How do we become what He wants us to be? How can we get there? Well, the thing is, is we have to first know what pleases Him and what displeases Him. And then we have to implement those things that please and purge out those things that do not. And that's what makes these seven messages so vital, so critical to us as a church, for us as a church. Why? Because they come right from the mouth, from our Lord, from the head of the church. No, does that make the church epistles any less? Absolutely not. They're the Word of God too. But these are special in a very real way, I don't think we should miss that, in the, in the regard to the fact that the, the Lord himself gives seven messages to seven churches. 
And we'll, we'll, we'll move off of that and look further at the next point here when we, when we get to that. But we have to be willing to do and to see in these messages what pleases Him and what we need to do to get to the place where we are on that path for Him. Second point on introductory matters. The day we live in. The day we live in. Over, you don't have to turn there. But if you go over there to Matthew chapter 24 and 25, it's a text called the Olivet Discourse. And it's the, the discourse we studied in Sunday school just recently. And we finished that up. But it, it speaks of the times that will precede the signs that will precede the second coming of the Lord. Well, we're not talking about the rapture, which is what we're waiting on. That's what's next in the, in the agenda. And there's no signs to indicate when that will actually occur. Uh, it's imminent. It could occur at any moment. It could occur right at this moment. We could be snatched out of here right now. But the Olivet Discourse paints a picture of the signs that will prevail or, or be during that period prior to His coming. When you read that, when you read that, you're like, wow, <laughs> I see all of this. I see so much of this happening right now. And we're not even looking for those things. It, it, it just speaks of the day we live in as to are we, are, are we closer to the Lord's return than what we realize? I believe we're very close, to be honest. I'm, I'm hoping we're real close. <laughs> I'd be fine with being snatched out of here this morning. Truly. Uh, it, 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 I, would, I would much what, uh, rather be in the presence uh, of the Lord and with Him forever and ever. Uh, truly. And I didn't even hear any amens. I don't know about you guys, but I, I'm ready to go. Because it's far better there. You may think it's good here, but it doesn't even compare. It pales in every way. To what we have in Christ when we, when we come into His presence. Every way. Every way. The best things we have. I'm just throwing this out. Or I'm getting on a side message. But the best things we have in this life. Are just a gift from God. So that we can understand. Just how special heaven will be. Because it's magnified. By, I don't even know how you put a number on it. Because it's perfect. It's right. Everything. There's no, it's not tainted in any way. And that's what awaits us. But the day we live in is, is spoken of by Paul. Jesus talked about the second coming. That's the second coming. We're not even looking for that necessarily. But the signs are already. We see these things happening. But I want you to go over to 2 Timothy. Go over to 2 Timothy. And there's a familiar text over here in uh, chapter 3 that I want us to look at that speaks of the end times. The times prior to the church being even snatched out. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, Without self-control, brutal, haters of God, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. It just speaks of the character of the last days. Now, when I read that, I don't know about you, but when I read that, the question comes to my mind, what days are we living in? Looks a lot like the last days. What we see, how people think. What motivates people? What's the priorities of people's lives? Even the ones who, hold, who claim it, they hold to a form of godliness, yet deny its power. They, they, they put on the pretense of, of God and, and religion, but yet they deny the very power of it. 
And so we see these times. So what days are we living in? I, I, I would say we're living in the last days. Now, I'm going to throw this out at you. This is Timothy, 2 Timothy. This is written centuries ago by Paul. He said it then. How much more so now the time we're living in? What time are we in? What day are we living in? And that ought to cause us to understand we need to wake up. It ought, it ought, to, it ought to set down on us that we need to realize our time and we need to take inventory of, of what it is and where I am as a believer and as a church. And we have these messages from the Lord telling us, this is what I love. These are the things I love about my people that they do in the church. These are the things I love. And then he says about some, these things are condemnable. These are, these are terrible. And you will be judged for those unless you repent of them. So if we're living in this time frame, I'm just throwing it out to, to establish the importance of these messages. If we're living in the time frame where, where we're, we're breathing on the Lord's return to snatch us up to be with himself, it's incumbent upon us to make the changes that are necessary to be in a position where we're pleasing the Lord. And then also, not that we're bad on every front, but undergird the good things. What makes us good? What we're, the Lord could say, you're doing a good job in this vein. We ought to undergird those things. Why? Because we're all going to stand before the Bama seat judgment of our Lord. This glorified Christ who sees it all. He knows our hearts. He knows our church. He knows, he knows Prairie Bible. <laughs> this little church in Delavan. He's very much aware of us. He knows every one of you personally. He knows your heart. He knows your, where, where you're at in your mind as it relates to Him, His Word, His church. He does. And so these messages, by understanding our time, you, you look at these and you're like, thank you, Lord, for giving us these messages that tell us what pleases you. This is what makes, this is what pleases you, Lord. And these are the things you, you, you want us to be rid of and to change and to turn, change direction, come back to where we need to be to be on that path. Very important. Third point, introductory matter. Significance of the placement of these messages. The significance of placement of these messages. Go to Revelation chapter 22. Real quick. And I want to look at verses 18 through 20. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And I'm going to tell you, we don't want that. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. He who testifies of these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Amen. So what do we have here? Why do I go to these passages, this passage? Because what we learn at the, in these couple verses here, this is the last book of the Bible, Revelation. It's the, the last book of, of our Bible. Rightly so, it was the last one. Pen, Revelation. There's no more to be added. This is it. This is the end of, of the book, the book. Not just the revelation, but the entirety of the, of the revealed truth. The revelation, the giving of truth to man. This is it. He's given it to us right here. This, this is what He's given us. And that makes what Jesus says in these messages very significant for us. 
Because this is the last word in the last days. As it relates to His church. We have in these messages, we're not going to get direct revelation from the Lord as it relates to His church. This is it. No one's going to add to it or take away from this book. I believe that's the incumbent on the whole, the whole word, but this prophecy. This was the closing book. This is it. Of His direct revelation to man. He's given it here. And so in light of that, in light of that, these are Jesus' last words to the corporate body and the individual church member. These are His last words to His church and to the members of His church. And He gives us what He expects of us and what He requires of His church and His people. Last words for the last days. Right here. For us. They're powerful. I'm telling you. We ought to spend time. This, these, ought to be, these ought to be texts that we go back to. These messages. These ought to be. They, they shouldn't be something that we touch on one time. These ought to be things we're checking on. You know. What, what is it Lord that, I, that you love? Be reminded of these things. Especially in the day we're living in. The fourth. Perspectives of approach. How we're going to take these four messages. We kind of hit on this just briefly. And I told you I would give you more on that when we got to these messages. And you're getting it right now. We're talking about the perspectives of how we're going to approach these seven messages. Uh, how are we supposed to take them? Well, we're going to, we're going to be touching on uh, four different perspectives as we move through here. Uh, what we have first is there's a historical perspective. As you look at these messages to these seven churches, there's a historical context. And what do I mean by that? There's a historical setting. These are seven literal churches. Okay? There are seven literal churches that are named here, each of these churches. Ephesus, Pergamon, Sardis, Thyatira, the Philadelphia, uh, all of these uh, churches that are meant, Laodicea, they're all mentioned here. They're specific churches. The thing is, is, so they're addressing people in a historical moment in time. That's there. You can't forsake that. So that helps us, by the way, to understand certain things that become very relevant with each of these churches because each of the churches have their own story. They're sitting in a different location from the other ones. They had certain things uh, and attributes uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, elements in their community, society, that the other one might not have had, but they're relying on. And when we understand that, we can make applications for our own selves. In regard to that. So there's a historical setting. That's one perspective. We're going to look at these as, hey, there were seven churches. There was one in Ephesus. You know, there was one in all these cities. So that'll help us. Second perspective is a prophet prophetical perspective. Each church represents the church at a given period uh, in church history. Example. Uh, the, the Apostolic Church, the Reformation Church, the End Times Church would be Laodicea. So these churches, the, and you say, well, why are we going to do that? Because I thought you just said there's seven little churches. They are. But here's the thing. We've already touched on this in the introductory matters for the entire book. And that is this. There were way more than seven churches. Okay, even in Asia, there were more than seven churches that we know about when he wrote this. So why did he pick seven? Seven is the number of what? Completeness. So, it, it, so, so it's not a big jump to think that the Lord chose these seven churches and he, he, he narrowed it down to seven because he's, there is a prophetical looking forward that each church in time can actually match a period of church history where the ills and the positives were predominant during that period, prophetically looking forward. 
So we're going to look at it in, on a prophetical vein to a certain degree. We won't press any of this as like dogma, but we're not going to miss it either. Third, it's representative uh, perspective. What are we talking about here? What each church represents in every age. What are we saying? Everything you see in any one of these churches can be evident at any point in history in any church. You understand what I'm saying? So the ills of the church at Ephesus, although uh, uh, prophetically speaking, might be the apostolic church, the, the ill of losing your first love, that could be something we're dealing with here. All these years later, we're in the end times church, let's say. We're, we're the Laodicean deal. Those are our ills. When you look at the church today, how would you define them? Prophetically speaking, I think we match up pretty close with the Laodicean ones. We're not hot, we're not cold, we're just lukewarm. You're kind of sitting on our hands, are you coming back or are you not coming back? When you come back, I hope I'm sitting in the right spot, Lord. You know? That, that's kind of how we look at it. And we're not motivated. We're not really fired up for the Lord. We're not charged up to be counting for Him. But, but they also are representative. These ills that you see in any of these churches can be evident in our church. They can be there. Or they can, or even the good things. You know, the good things. Ephesus was great on doctrine. They didn't tolerate no nonsense when it came to manipulating God's Word. They were warriors for that. And he loved that. He loved it. But, but they, they lost their first love. There's ills and there's positives. Okay? And so we see these things and they can be represented or be evident in any age. Fourth one. Fourth perspective as we go through here, we got to understand something. The church is not an entity of its own. Churches are churches because they're made up of people. The church is people. Prairie Bible, this building and the corporate identity, it's not going to be stamped lost first love and then this building gets torched because they lost. No. No. We're accountable as individuals. The church is people. We're an assembly of God's children. And we, 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 we're, we're, we're here, uh, and He's our head. And so we're going to look at these churches and their ills, and we're going to apply them, and we're going to understand. He's not talking about this, the entity, quote, Prairie Bible. Prairie Bible is you. Ephesus was Ephesus. Laodicea was the people of Laodicea. The church of Laodicea. The assembly that gathered in Laodicea. That's what we're talking about. So there's that individual application. And by the way, I don't think anybody here is going to have any trouble making applications with these. You're going to see them in your own life. Yeah, the, these messages can be brutal, but they can be wonderful too. And I always find the brutality of the word, which is never brutal, but it's just honest. I find that to be very refreshing in my own life because it tells me the Holy Spirit still loves, loves me. God still loves me, and, or he wouldn't bother with me. Understand that. If he puts it on your heart and he's, and he's convicting you of something, you've got to look at that right. It's him saying, I still love you. You're my child. I've got more for you. I, I've got more for you. Just step. Do what I ask. It's him saying I love you. That's what it is. I'm go I've got more. I'll move you on. So don't look at it as a negative. When the word of God comes to bear on your life, say thank you Jesus for letting me know that I need to make this change so that I can be more pleasing to you. All right. Fifth, final Introductory matter on the messages. Our hearts as we approach the messages. How do I, how do, how do we come at these? Well, this study uh, touches, folks, I should say this. When you look at, not the study, the whole, the whole book of Revelation has been great. But these seven messages that we're going to look at, they touch on subjects, uh, such matters as advancement, advancing for the Lord, moving forward for the Lord, 
See, I, and I think that's a powerful one. We'll get to that as we move through these messages. But it, it, it touches on advancement. The need to, to the, we need to be advancing for the cause of Christ. Too much of the church is in neutral or, in, or on a detour thinking that what they're doing is, is church when all it is is they've lost Jesus and they've lost the Word, they've lost doctrine, they've lost all of those elements, and they're just fixing ills. And I'm not saying you shouldn't minister to ills, but the church should be advancing, growing, moving. Now, I'm not talking numbers because it's not all about numbers, but we need to be advancing. Second, it touches on matters of doctrinal purity. It t- touches on matters of moral purity. It touches on love for the Lord and love for God's people. These messages touch on zeal and passion in the, in the work of the Lord, for the Lord Himself and for His work and for His Word. It touches on issues of loyalty to Jesus and to His church. It touches on honesty what it is to walk honestly before the Lord and before people. The subject matters contained in these messages can be hard, as I said, but it's also very applicable. These, they're very applicable matters that we face and we struggle with as individuals and as a corporate body. That's what we have here. Where are you at? I'm asking you. Because I'm not up here just to teach the book of Revelation. I'm here to teach the book of Revelation to see lives changed for the glory of God. I'm not playing church. I don't want to be playing church when Jesus comes. I'm just being honest with you. I want to be a pastor of a church that wants to be pleasing to the Lord Jesus. I don't care if it's small like Prairie Bible or 3,000 people. I would say the same thing to the 3,000 that I'm saying to you. So I'm not saying it just because of who we are. I'm just telling you that if we're going to go into these messages, there's seven messages to seven churches from our Lord Jesus where He tells them, I love this about you, but I can't stand this. Are we going to just go through it and say, thank you, Lord, that we're all this over here. I don't want to hear this, and I'm not going to change on this. This is the time when we're going through this. God has brought us here together. We're in this study. We're going through this, and it's His Holy Spirit that, 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 that moves in our midst with His Word. And I'm telling you, we ought to be attentive. Our hearts need to become, be coming in here. We need to be prepared To receive from the Lord. And he says seven different times that we need to listen. If we have ears, hear what the Spirit says to what? The churches. He's not talking about just hear it. He's talking to hear it and heed it. Repent, turn, do what's necessary. I'm praying that as we go through these messages, and this isn't the first time we've done this, by the way. I don't even remember the date when we went through all of them. It was, I think it was, uh, uh, it was in single digits. Digits. It's been. You got it. Well, we went through all seven churches, and I did these messages. And anyway, this is this is the first time I've ever preached it from the, the 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 whole book from the pulpit. But I'm telling you, God's given us His word. We can't play games with it, and it's a matter of our own hearts. It really is. We can just play with the Word of God and be a church, or we can be His church. And our goal can be to glorify the Lord, even if we're the little as much church. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with it. I, I've, I've said that all my whole ministry. I, I, I don't have a problem pastoring in this church or any church if, if, if He puts me there, but I want to be the best one we can be. That's all I want. And that's what should be our goal. So when we move through here, let's come with prepared hearts. And let's prioritize this. These are, again, seven messages to seven churches from the Lord in the last book of the Bible. 
You get that? This, this, is, this is his last word in the last days to his church. This is what he's given. Here it is. I'm gonna, here they are. I'm going to talk to this church, this church, this church, this church, this church, and this church, and this church. Seven of them. We need to glean from it. We need to grow. But it's a matter of our own hearts. I'm praying that the Lord tears me up as much as He tears you up, but that He builds us up in light of tearing us down, that we can reach a better place for His glory, every one of us. So where, to where we're just not putting time in, to where we're really being what, what pleases Him, because that's really all that matters. That's really all that matters. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to thank You for where we're at in this study. And Lord, I pray that by your spirit, as we move through these, these messages to the seven churches, that you, you would fire our souls on a whole new level, that we would truly see these for, for what they should be to us, and that we would glean from them those things, Lord, that you esteem in your people and in your church. And then also being willing to recognize uh, those things that are condemnable by you, which is your right. It's your church, Lord. And you have the right to judge us. And I, I pray that we would see those things, but not only see them, but that we would have a heart to repent, to change them, to, to turn and, and to move forward for your glory, Lord. Bring this, this, these messages to bear in our life as a church body here at Prairie and in, in our life as individual children of God, each one of us. May we own our part and may we grow together for your glory and be that church that we ought to be and that the world needs in this day. Bless each one, Lord, for being out this morning. I do pray you bless our day ahead of us and the week out ahead of us as well. Help us to count for your glory. And we just ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.